Hey there, Touch Designer developers. Welcome to another Touch Designer tutorial. In this video, we're going to look at creating a drawing program that uses the Connect V2 to track your hand position and make a simple pixelated drawing on screen based on how you move your hand around in space. This is a uh, great tutorial or lesson for people who are first diving into the Connect and want to see how you can create a more or less fully featured program that utilizes the many, or at least several of the many chop channels that come out of the uh, the Connect and into Touch Designer. We actually have more than just drawing functionality in this program. For example, you can actually switch between the draw mode and what's called the move mode, which basically just allows you to move your cursor around like you would be able to do in any sort of desktop drawing program. Um, we can then flip back to draw and then if I close both of my hands, we can switch to an eraser mode, which allows us to erase portions of the image. And then uh, if we go back to drawing, we can then draw in that area. Um, besides that, as you might have guessed by what is up in the upper left corner, you can actually choose a color to draw in at any given time by moving your non-dominant hand forward and backward in space and then flicking your index finger up. Uh, after you've set a new draw color, that is what you will use to draw on screen with. And as you can see here, depending on the settings that we'll go over later on with the feedback loop that generates the drawing, you can choose how your different colors that you're drawing in will interact with each other. So for example, this purple color does not replace any of the blue tiles that are already on the screen. But if I chose a brighter color, maybe like a light green, you can see how now I can replace all of these darker colored tiles with this new color that I'm working in. So we'll look at again later on how we can mess with that. And then finally, uh, because you don't always want to have to erase everything that's on screen by hand, we do have the ability by flicking up both of your index fingers to clear everything on screen. So why don't we jump into the network and take a look at how all of this stuff works and then we can actually build this thing. So this is the network here. I will uh, turn off this display here so we can actually take a look at the different operators. There's not a whole lot going on outside of this CHOP network, which is what uh, brings in the connect channels and, and makes all of the functionality work. But besides that, we've got a feedback loop, which is where our drawing is generated from. And basically there is a, um, a square that appears within this rectangle top that follows the movement of whatever dominant hand you've decided to choose. And then it's run into this feedback loop and that basically generates trails, which will stay on screen uh, forever because we're not doing any sort of manipulation to that signal. And then we also have the ability to erase, which we'll look at later on, which basically subtracts uh, from that, that signal. Then we take that top texture and we apply it to a number of instances of a rectangle SOP and that is what gives us this kind of uh, pixelated look with that spacing in between the different um, instances here. I, I liked that look better and in a future video we'll look at how we can start to take advantage of the fact that this is actually 3D geometry that we are drawing with. After that we have ourselves the user interface and the cursor being composited in, and then our final output uh, stage is right there. The connect network is the most complex part and what will take us the longest to build here. Uh, but even with that said, it's not the most crazy thing that you'll uh, develop in Touch Designer. Um, and the way that we are going to build this thing is we're gonna start with the SOP geometry, the render pipeline, user interface, even though we won't have anything to connect to the user interface yet, I just want to get that set up and ready to roll for when we do get those channels. Uh, and then we will build this top network that generates the drawing. And then finally, the longest part of the video will be dedicated to building this chop functionality, which will then route to everything else. So with that, let's jump in and start to build this thing. All right, so I've left myself a couple of reference materials up in the top, uh, which you will not need to worry about. Let's go ahead and jump in and work on the SOP portion of the network like I was just mentioning. So we're gonna start off here with a rectangle SOP, which is going to be the geometry that will be instanced and sort of act as pixels for our final output. I'm gonna set my size parameter here to 0.5 for both the X and the Y 
size parameters. Uh, we'll hook up a null to that and then right click on the output, grab a geometry comp. Now that we've got that set up, let's get a camera and a constant mat. We don't really need shading for this. Within the constant mat, uh, let's make sure we turn on blending transparency because we are gonna have alpha in our uh, texture, top texture that we're applying to this geometry. Now go ahead and drag that constant onto the geo, hit parameter material, and uh, we're pretty much good to go. I am going to, well, we'll adjust the camera once we get the instancing set up. Let's also grab a render top and hook up a null to that render just so that we've got that all prepped and ready to go. And then before we work on the top network, let's build our uh, little instancing network here and get this geo making some copies of this rectangle SOP for us. Uh, so that was done with a grid SOP and we'll add a null to that as well. And within the grid top, we need to make a couple of modifications. First of all, the size should be set to 16 in the X and nine in the Y, uh, which will give us the aspect ratio that we're gonna be using in this case. We're, we're gonna be working with the 1280 by 720 resolution uh, so that anyone without a commercial license can follow along with this tutorial. Um, and then we're going to use for the rows and columns, we're going to do 18 rows and 32 columns. Those values just come from multiplying our size values by two, so that we're going to have a little bit of a higher density grid of instances. Uh, now that we've got that set up, let's rename it actually to POS for positions, and we can come into our geo comp here, go to the instance page, flip on instancing, and grab that POS null, put that in for the translate operator, and then we can grab the P0, 1, and 2 channels within that section, and we've started generating some instances. So this is basically the canvas with which we'll be drawing on later on. Um, now that we have that rendering, let's go ahead and modify our camera position so that we are able to see at least most of this grid. So I found that 19.75 for the Z translate parameter for my camera gave me, you know, most everything is in view. The edges are cut off a little bit, but it didn't really matter for the uh, this output that much. Um, so great, we've got that all set up. Now we can start to add in our user interface, which we are going to do via just some simple compositing. So let's grab that composite top and we're going to set this before we even start to over in the operation and then uh, the first layer that we'll want above our render here is a uh, cursor which we're going to achieve via a rectangle top which just moves around our screen uh, so grab yourself a rectangle top we can connect that to our composite now and then we'll have to do some modifications to this um, so within the rectangle top, first of all, let's make sure that we're using the same 1280 by 720 resolution that we are in the render. So just come to the common page, set that, and then our size is a little bit too big for our liking here. Um, I ended up going with a size of 0.03 for both the X and Y parameters, and that gave us that uh, smaller square that we see now. Um, we will eventually add a chop reference to the center position. I did use a color of red for my cursor in the original example um, because I found that it gave pretty good contrast for most of the colors that are drawn except for those in obviously the red and like the orange range. Uh, so you can use red if you want. You could also use white because as a matter of fact, the drawing program, the way that we're setting up the color selection will never actually be able to draw with uh, the color white. You could modify it to do so, but we won't be doing that in the scope of this tutorial at least. So you could leave it white and that'll be a sort of obvious call out that this is not a pixel that's been drawn, but actually the cursor that's following your hand around the screen. Uh, that is actually all we're gonna do with this operator for now. I do wanna make sure that I composite this over top of the render and not underneath it. So I'm gonna flip it up in the order, uh, input order. And then 
Finally, let's rename this cursor so that we know, uh, we'll call it cursor space rectangle. So we know that that is what the functionality of that particular operator is. And then um, if we look back at our original image here of our interface, so what, what was basically going on is we had three actual text tops that were uh, adding user interface elements. One of them was a draw color or the draw color text, which showed you the current color that you were drawing on screen. So you can see it's orange and that is why uh, we see some of these orange pixels. I must have changed the color to orange at that point and started drawing with it. On the right side of the screen, we have this mode text that changes to show us which mode we are currently in. And then actually at the bottom right, although you don't see it right now, whenever you hold up your two index fingers and clear the screen, a little text box will appear that says clear. That is just confirming that that is uh, currently occurring. So we'll add all of those text elements, but then we also need to add these little tiny lines here, which are actually just rectangle tops that have been adjusted to fit. So this one here under draw color shows the current color essentially that you are selecting with the Z position of your left hand. And if you remember, you move that back and forward in Z space to run through the different hues available to you. And then you flick your index finger of your left hand up to set that as the current draw color. On the right side, we actually have a matching little line like this, which we can't see right now, which basically animates. It goes from basically not appearing at all to uh, slowly increasing in size across the uh, width of this piece of text until we have basically hit the maximum point. And what that is showing us when it's animating is that we're holding our hands in these particular gestures to switch between modes, which take actually a period of two seconds to cause that switch to happen. So it's a visual indicator showing us how much longer essentially we have to hold our hands in those positions before it switches. Without that, it's kind of hard to tell exactly how long uh, we have to hold our hands in that position. So again, that's just going to be a rectangle top that's exactly the same as this one that's set up on this side of the screen. So essentially we have five elements that we will be compositing into our network here. We'll start basically by doing them as a group. So I'm going to do the two draw or color tops on the left side here first, and we'll copy and paste those and build the right ones and then finish up with the clear text. Uh, so we'll start with the text top. And I'm going to flip this display off and just double check on my parameters here. Let's get the parameter window back up. So for the text parameter, let's call this draw color. And while we're at it, let's rename this operator to draw color text uh, so that we are very clear what's going on here. And on the font page, I ended up going with a font that I found out should be installed on Windows 10 by default. So you should have access to this on a Windows computer called Franklin Gothic Medium. There are other uh, typefaces within this font family, but uh, Medium should be the one that's installed by default. I'm not so sure about the other ones. Um, then because we actually have to position this based on the um, the resolution that we're going to be using in the final output. I'm going to change that before the positioning. So we'll come to the common page here, change our resolution to the same 1280 by 720. And then we can come back to the font page and modify our position. So remember, we want it in this upper left corner. So we can actually change the horizontal align setting to left, and then the vertical align setting to top, and that'll put it up in the top left corner. But you'll see that there's a little bit of padding around it in our original. So I'm going to add some border space here. I put in for both these parameters 60. And that kind of positions it nicely up in that corner. Uh, we're not going to worry about the color settings right now because those are going to be um, applied via chops, which we don't have. That's actually good to go as is. Now we can grab a rectangle and start modifying that as well. So this one, I'm, I'm going to start by modifying the resolution to 1280 by 720. And then let's come back to the rectangle page and make some modifications here. So first of all, let's change our justify horizontal to left because we want this to be on the left side of the screen. Um, my size parameters for this one were 0 0.145 
and 0 0.002 for the Y parameter, which made it a skinny little line like that. You're welcome to, of course, make this bigger if you want um, so that it's either more visible or just kind of suited to your particular tastes. Uh, the center position I landed on was 0 0.048 in the X and 0 0.35 in the Y. And um, if we had composited this, or we will composite this right now, you should see that that appears uh, right under the text itself. Um, and actually we might not be able to see it right now because we've got a white background, but rest assured it will appear there. Uh, so let's select both of those things and drag them into this composite top. And then again, we want the render to be the bottom layer and the cursor to be the second from bottom. So let's make sure that we switch our input order so that both of our uh, draw color text and our little bar underneath that are above it. And I'm also remembering we need to make sure that we rename this second operator so we know that it is not just a rectangle, but actually our current space color space bar. Eventually, when we have our chops set up, that will show us basically the corresponding color to the position of our non-dominant hand. Now that we've got those set up, we can actually copy and paste them because the um, components on the right side of the screen use the same font and scaling settings and positioning and all that kind of stuff. So let's go ahead and copy those two things and paste them below. We're going to rename both of these uh, right now to mode uh, space text for the text top and then for the rectangle, we'll call this one mode space bar. Um, we need to, within the mode text parameter or text text top, we need to make a couple of changes. Um, let's start on the text page. So we're going to be using a dat basically to feed this uh, top the particular mode uh, that we are in currently. We're going to grab that from a cell within a table because we have three different modes that we're going to be flipping between. So we'll set that up in a second. But the first thing that we're going to want to do is um, remove that draw color text parameter and replace it with mode colon space. And then um, within the positioning, or sorry, the font page, we're going to modify the positioning of this thing. So we are not going to modify the horizontal alignment in this case, which might be the obvious choice because, because this is going to be changing the uh, text that is being displayed here. The width of this, this uh, text is actually going to change because we're not using a monospaced font. And we want, in, or at least the way that I set this up, I wanted the uh, little bar that appears underneath it and the text to always have the same left alignment and not shift when that text uh, increases in width. So we're actually just going to move the X position instead of changing the alignment. So I ended up with an X position of 950, which shifted it way over here. And um, that was actually everything that I modified within that operator. Um, we might as well grab ourselves that table bat now, however, so that we can hook that up and have it ready for us later on. So we're going to add two rows to this table bat. And the first one in the first cell, we're going to enter draw and then move and then erase. And those are the three modes that we'll set up later on. Now that we've got that set up, let's drag that into the mode text top and use the parameter dat, uh, which has placed it right here on the text page under dat. Eventually, we're going to add a chop reference, which is going to allow us to move between these different um, rows of that table. But for now, we're just going to leave it like that. And then we can come to the mode bar operator and modify that as well. Um, this is going to have a chop reference that modifies both the size parameter and the fill color eventually. So we're not going to modify those for now, but we will change the center position. Uh, we're going to change this to 0 0.79 in the X and we're going to leave the Y alone. And that will just position it directly underneath that draw operator. Um, let's go ahead and composite those things in now and move them up in the input order. So again, mode text and mode bar we want above cursor rectangle and the render. 
Um, I'm gonna go ahead and flip this render off so we can just make sure that our alignment looks okay. And it looks pretty good. It looks like we might need to move our mode bar over just a little bit. So I think I'm gonna do that now um, just so that those left side of that text is aligned. So I ended up with a center position of 0 0.792 actually for this mode bar. So make sure you change that on yours as well. You'll notice that the width doesn't match and that doesn't matter because we're gonna be controlling that with a chop channel later on. Um, so all of that stuff looks good, but we might as well, um, let's at the same time finish up by adding the clear text as well. Uh, so I'm just gonna copy, I'll copy the draw color text because we won't have to delete as much from it. Um, and then we'll place that down here and we'll rename this right away to clear space text. Then we'll come to the text page here and change this to just say clear. And we actually want this to be in the bottom right corner and not the upper left. So we're gonna have to do a couple of modifications here. Um, let's come to the font page for our position options. And in this case, we're, we are going to change the horizontal alignment to right. And then um, we are going to change the vertical alignment to bottom. And then I did actually modify the position parameter here to two uh, in the X. And I don't know if that's really doing a whole lot for us right now, but we won't worry about it too much. Um, let's go ahead and composite that in and just see how it looks with the alignment of everything else. And again, we'll move this up in the input order. And it looks like if we use that line right there, that's close enough uh, in alignment um, so that's actually it for our user interface. As I said, we're going to add all kinds of chop references to make this functional later on, but we're not going to worry about it right now. Um, and now we can actually turn this display off. And before we move on, I am going to add an out top so that we can look at this full screen in the future. And then you'll want to make sure I've already done this, but within the perform operator up a level or the perform window operator up a level, uh, make sure you set the opening size to fill and the border switch to off so that when we do view this full screen, we won't, uh, it won't appear in a window. Okay, so we've got that complete and now we can actually build the top network that is the functionality that generates the drawing. So we actually will use one of these little reference objects now so that we can take a look at exactly what is going to happen with this particular part of the network. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is building ourselves a feedback loop that will take the uh, position of one of your hands and have a little tiny uh, rectangle or a square actually within this rectangle top follow the position of your hand. That will be hooked up to a feedback loop which will allow this trail, this kind of infinite trail to generate behind your, uh, your rectangle as it moves around the screen. And then um, we'll have the ability as well to switch to a different mode, which let me just turn this off right now, which will allow us to um, erase. And what will happen with the eraser functionality is that if you, uh, let me just flip the mode right now, the eraser functionality will turn off the um, alpha channel for our draw rectangle and turn on the alpha for our erase rectangle, which is found within this feedback loop. And we're using a subtract operator here to subtract this texture from the rectangle top from our feedback signal, which effectively is allowing us to erase. And so you'll see here now that when I move my mouse around, we are able to erase those pixels. Um, so besides those two things, we are gonna have the ability to uh, clear the screen and also change the color of this draw rectangle so we can have a little bit more variety to our drawings. Uh, but I just wanted to explain basically what's gonna happen with that functionality first so you understand kind of where we're going. Uh, so now that we've got that explained, let me just move that back out of the way and we will jump in here. Um, all right, so we're gonna start with a rectangle top and this is where we are actually going to need to make some references to our instancing uh, operators. And basically we need the output of this a uh, whole network actually to have the same number of pixels as there are instances so that we can have colors applied 
or data essentially for each one of our instances. And we are going to grab the number of rows and columns from our grid SOP here and apply that to the resolution parameters within this rectangle to achieve that. So the first thing I'm actually going to do before that though is rename this to draw rectangle so I know that that is what this is and then we can actually come to this resolution parameter and start writing some expressions. For our width parameter, op open parentheses single quote even though it shows a double quote down here, grid one single quote, close parenthesis, dot par, dot calls. So we're grabbing the number of columns and applying that to our width. Then we're gonna copy this uh, expression and paste it into the height parameter here and change the end portion here from calls to rows and hit enter. And we should have a 32 by 18 pixel rectangle now, or uh, output resolution rather. Um, let's change the input smoothness and the viewer smoothness to nearest pixel. We're going to be using nearest pixel in this particular network for all of our operators. And then let's come to the, the uh, rectangle parameter page and make a couple more uh, modifications. I changed my size parameter, the units to pixels, and then the size itself to two by two pixels, which gives us this really small little square. Um, after that, the center will be a chop reference from the connect as well as the fill alpha. Uh, so we are actually done with that for now. Um, I'm gonna attach a null to that and then we can get into building our actually very simple little feedback network. So let's go ahead and hook up the feedback top right now. Um, and we will put after the feedback top as I showed you just a moment ago, a subtract top which will give us that erasing functionality. Then we'll attach a null after that and a composite and as i said in the beginning of the video actually um, and make sure you connect this null to the composite so this composite here is important because the operation that you select is actually going to affect how your drawing appears on screen we'll look at experimenting with that later on but that is important and it is actually something that you can mess with on your own to see what kinds of results you can get so we used the brightest mode in the original version, and that's what we use here, but you're welcome to experiment with different modes. Um, I'm gonna attach a null to the end, and then we're going to need to attach something to the subtract operator. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is copy and paste the draw rectangle and move that over here. And that's because we are going to want to use all of the same settings or the resolution and stuff that we've set there for our eraser. So let's connect that to the subtract operator. And then I am going to bump the size of the erase rectangle up to three so that it erases more than one pixel at a time. Let's also change the name of this operator to erase space rectangle. And then uh, we are going to add, again, chop control over all this stuff later on, but we're just gonna kind of get it ready to roll for that moment. Um, I'm gonna rename this null to, um, I don't know, draw output or something drawing output, uh, just so that we're clear on that. And then we can actually, um, well, first of all, let's make sure we're in nearest pixel for everything first. So I'm gonna select everything from the feedback to the composite, come to the common page, flip everything to nearest pixel so that no smoothing is occurring. And now we can actually take that drawing output operator and apply it to our second instancing page here. Uh, we're kind of getting our little um, keystroke viewer is in the way here. Let me see if I can just move that out of the way. Um, we're going to take this drawing output null, bring it in for our color operator and grab the R, G, B and alpha channels for that section. And now we should see on our output here that we are indeed getting um, something different and it's not just uh, a full white screen anymore. So we are actually done with the kind of basics uh, of the top and SOP portions of the network and we can actually jump into the most complex and what will no doubt be the longest part of this video which is dealing with the CHOP control. 
So I'm going to bring over my Connect camera operator for the ability to reference as we're building this, um, and then we can jump right into that. So to start off our chop network, we are going to grab the Connect chop, and that is what is going to bring in all the different uh, functionality of the Connect in chop form. And so you'll see that there are, if you've never looked at this before, a ton of different channels uh, which pull in all kinds of different information about the different parts of your body in space. Um, and we will need to make a couple of different modifications to the uh, parameters within this before we move on here. And the first one of those is actually switch the skeleton setting to seated. Now, the way that I have built this out is essentially assuming that at least for the uh, you know building of this network, you're going to be seated and using it in a seated position. You could definitely you know change this and modify it so that it could be used in a more like traditional installation format where it's projected and people are standing and walking around and all that stuff. But um, for all of us uh, touch designer developers at home, I'm just assuming that we're going to be using it in a seated position. And so that's why we're using that seated um, skeleton setting. And while we're on that subject, um, if you do end up wanting to kind of adapt this for a standing like installation form, I'll at least point out the areas that you can experiment and modify the network so that you can do that. You'll basically have to change a couple of uh, parameter ranges to effectively track those different uh, controls that we are, will be mapping um, in that kind of a space. So anyways, let's not spend too much time digressing on that. Um, the other thing we're gonna switch on within here is the interactions switch. And that gives us those, the ability to um, detect whether or not our hands are open or closed or whether or not I'm raising or uh, raising an index finger or not. Uh, that's what the lasso channel there is called. And that is actually everything that we're going to do within that operator. Uh, the way that I approached the next bit was using a select chop to selectively pull the channels that I wanted out of this instead of always having this huge jumble that you ha kind of have to zoom in really close to see. Uh, so we're going to grab that select chop now. And I'm going to rename this to connect space select. Um, and then we're going to grab the channels that we need. So within the channel names parameter here, you'll see if we pulled on this drop down, there are a whole bunch of different things we can select. And so we're not actually going to do it that way. We're going to use some pattern matching here to grab the channels that we need. Um, and we are setting this up to be used by a single person at a time, but I did want to give you the opportunity of, you know, being able to pull in multiple users if you ever want to. So we are going to specify P1 for the first person that this detects. The Connect V2 can track multiple people at the same time, if you weren't aware. Uh, P1 slash hand underscore L and then colon and then asterisk and that's going to grab all channels with that matched pattern um, and you'll see we have the tx ty and tz for the left hand now uh, we're not actually going to use all these but i at least want to have them available to us um, then we're going to copy and paste that and put a space between those two things and just change the hand underscore l to hand underscore r so that we now have the right hand pulled in and then we need two other things. We want to get the channels for the interactions that we're going to be using here, which the only ones that we're actually going to be using are the lasso channels and the closed channels. So lasso again is raised index finger and closed is when you have closed your hand into a fist. Uh, so we're going to do this again with pattern matching. So P1 for person one asterisk closed will be the next one. Make sure you have spaces between all of these and then we'll add another space and do p1 asterisk lasso and now we've got the closed channels and the lasso channels and those are actually all of the channels that we are going to need for this network to function um, i'm going to attach a null after this just for good measure and now we can start building everything out here so the first thing that i'm going to do after that is 
we're going to build the uh, network that allows us to move our drawing uh, rectangles around in space. And so that is going to be done in this case with the right hand. So let's go ahead and grab ourselves yet another select chop, which I'm just aimlessly searching for here. Um, in this one, we are going to grab, as I said, the right hand only. So my uh, keystroke displayer kept crashing. So we're going to try a different one now, which hopefully will help you still be able to see the uh, different things that we're going to have to type in here a little bit more easily. Um, we were just about to select the right hand channels using pattern matching and okay so the way that we are going to get the channels that we are looking for is by typing in p1 slash hand underscore r colon asterisk hit enter and now we have all of the right hand channels only so we're actually going to split out into two separate branches the x and the y uh, right hand positions because we need to do a little bit of math to the chop channels that will be coming out of those things in order to position our rectangle that creates the drawing on screen. So let's grab another select chop and we'll build one branch and then copy and paste it for the second one so that we don't have to do it twice. Uh, we're just going to grab the TX channel for the top one and we're going to use a math chop to change the range of this output and here's where I'm going to bring in the um, connect camera for a little bit of a briefing about what we're going to do with this. So for this part of the network you're going to have to experiment a bit with your own particular setup uh, as our connects are likely not going to be positioned in the exact same spot in the room and uh, you know your distance and position uh, in conjunction with the connect will likely give you at least slightly different output values here. Um, we are assuming, as we talked about before, that you're going to be sitting down for the use of this. And so I wanted to make sure that your movements that you're doing with your right arm or your left arm, if that's what you chose for drawing, are reasonable uh, considering that situation and are not going to be either too tiring or just um, impossible to accomplish. So, for example, uh, when we're drawing, we don't want to have to move our right hand so far away that we either have to get out of the chair or move the chair um, in order to, say, reach like the leftmost edge of the screen or the rightmost edge of the screen. Uh, we want to make sure that that is like a reasonable range of motion that we're able to achieve from our current position. We also don't want to run into certain situations with the connect where um, it's actively tracking both hands accurately. And then in certain cases, at least what I found was if I cross them over, I mean, it's doing fairly well right now, but sometimes I ran into issues um, when dealing with the gestures, the interactive control that we're going to be adding later on and that crossing over. So I wanted to set up limits basically that kept the corresponding like cursor position and its connection to my right hand in a reasonable like area of space. So for me in my setup, I set the leftmost edge of the screen to occur approximately around the center line of my body. So like when my hand is in this position in any one of these different um, Y positions, that would be like the left side of the screen. And then I set on the opposite side a position around the edge of where this this uh, camera image is another um, limit that was like where the right edge of the screen uh, would would fall so what that means is i grabbed or i looked at the chop that we see there with the tx channel i looked at the value of the x position at those points in space and i just noted that and then added that into the math chop that we've just set up in the range section to um, use those values as my kind of maximum and minimum. So for me, it was approximately around zero in the X channel that I set my limit for the left edge of the screen. And then um, I put in approximately like 0 0.45 or so. So really that's only like here uh, for my right edge. So you're just going to have to experiment with your own range here to figure out what works for your particular situation. So now that we know those values, we can enter them into this math chop. So we'll come to the range page and 
the values that we've just noted to ourselves are going to be entered into the from range. So I'm going to do from range 0 to 0 0.45. And then what we're essentially going to do with those values is remap them or rearrange them to a new range, which is going to correspond to position values within this draw rectangle. So for anyone who hasn't dealt with the rectangle top before, the uh, positioning by default is done in what's called a fractional mode. And that means that a value in the X channel, since we're dealing with X information right now, negative 0.5 for the center position X will put the center point of our square on the leftmost edge. And then a value of positive 0.5 will put the center point on the rightmost edge. And the same is also true for the y values. So 0.5 will put the center point at the top edge and negative 0.5 would put it at the bottom. So basically we're using the math chop to take that input range and remap it over that negative 0.5 to positive 0.5 range so that our arm movement will get movement uh, within this rectangle's output resolution that makes sense and is usable. So again, we'll come back here and I'm going to set my two range to be negative 0.5 to positive 0.5. And that will give me again more reasonable uh, data that I can use to position that draw rectangle. So after that, we're going to add a limit chop so that we can limit the range of these uh, values that are coming in. And I basically just want to ensure that they never fall too far outside of that negative 0.5 to positive 0.5 range. So I'm going to change the type here to clamp. And then I'm going to set my minimum and my maximum to negative 0.6 and my maximum to positive 0.6. So that means that when I go outside of that range, uh, it will just clamp at the maximum or the minimum values. And I added a little bit of buffer here, as in I set these a little bit higher than negative 0.5 and positive 0.5 so that my rectangle top, when I adjust the center position to negative 0.6, for example, the square will disappear. And that means that I can basically move my hand off the screen and have this little buffer zone around our canvas where it won't draw. Um, you don't have to do that, but I'm just going to do that because it, I thought, aided in the functionality a little bit. Um, I am going to now copy this network and uh, paste it, and we will use the same exact functionality for the um, TY channels here. So we're just going to change within this second select chop. We're going to look for the TY channel instead. And then we need to set within our math chop a different range. And for me, I've already kind of explained this, so I'm not going to go through it again. But in my particular situation, I found that a from range of 0 to 0 0.5 worked pretty well. And the two range will stay the same. And then again, the limit will also stay the same. Finally, we can add a merge chop to get those two channels back into the same chop. And then I'll add a null, which we'll call cursor position for um, clarity's sake. We can actually make a chop reference from this right now so we can see exactly what has happened here. So I'm going to click on the draw rectangle. That's where we're going to be applying this, or at least one of the places where we'll be applying this. And let's add a chop reference to the center uh, parameter here for the X and the Y. Um, one thing that might also be helpful, since these are kind of arbitrary value or uh, channel names, I'm going to actually rename those right now as well before we move on. Uh, so in the select two chop, I'm going to call this one cursor underscore X in the uh, rename parameter field. And then I'm going to do the same for the select three operator cursor underscore y and we will have to remake that chop reference so let's do that one more time i just want to be very clear and have more concise naming for those things and now let me bring my camera back over and put it above um, so we'll take a look at what this has done. So you can see that the little square in our rectangle top is now following my hand and 
you know, we have a pretty reasonable range of motion here that's giving us a pretty accurate reading. It does miss track occasionally, which does happen with the Kinect. Um, sometimes you have to just move forward to get a better kind of sensor output, but I think overall this is looking pretty good. And for most of our simple uh, intents and purposes, this will work just fine. So again, with your particular network, you may have to mess with the ranges that you have within these math chops to get something um, functional, but um, those values, at least for me, worked just fine. So we finished our cursor position. Let's continue by setting up our color selection. Um, that is done, at least in the case of mine, with your left hand, the Z uh, position of your left hand. So that's what we're going to start off with. Uh, we're going to use a select chop here to grab the Z position of your left hand. And in this case, we don't need to do pattern matching because we're only looking for a single channel. So let's just grab the um, TZ channel from your left hand. So let's hook up to our newly selected Z channel here, a math chop. And we're going, we're going to, again, um, use the math chop to change the output range of this. So let me just bring my camera back in for a moment. This one does not matter so much in terms of accuracy. It's just more to show you what's going on. So um, you can see this is my left hand. And even when I'm moving it, this is a fairly, I mean, almost to the limits of the range of motion that I have while sitting down at least. Um, I'm going from approximately 1.8 to like 1.8 three or so in, in the Z channel uh, positions right now. So those are the values that I'm going to use for changing my output range here. Again, you'll just have to test and modify to your particular situation. So we'll do 1.8 uh, for the first part of that from range to 1.3. And then the output range of that will stay as zero to one. And that means if I turn the camera back on, when it's close, when my hand is closer to me, we'll get a, a value around zero. And then when it's kind of at its maximum extension, uh, we'll get a value of one. And we could even decrease that range a little bit. Um, I just want to have like a good range of motion so you can accurately like select a hue that you want instead of having to do like very tiny, subtle movements to get a color that you're looking for. Um, we're going to use a limit again, but this time, we're not going to clamp our values, we're going to cycle um, because that will let us, if we move past either of those two maximum or minimum values, uh, we will uh, be able to go through our cycle of colors once again. So I'm gonna set my limit here to be between zero and one and my type to loop. And then we can actually create ourselves some chop channels that will give us the colors for our um, drawing program here. So I'm going to do this with a pattern chop. And we're just going to make a couple of quick changes to the pattern chop here. So let's come to the channel page first of all and add ourselves some new channels and change the names of them. So we're going to type in R space G space B, hit enter. And now we have three channels with the names R, G, and B. Uh, we're going to change our phase step per channel setting to 0.25 which will shift the phase of the second and third channels. And then um, RGB values in Touch Designer go between zero and one by default, so we don't really need this sort of negative one to zero section. So we're just gonna change the from range here to fall between uh, negative one and one, leave the two range the same, and that had the effect of changing the output range of this pattern chop to fall between zero and one, and that is perfect for our use case. Uh, we're going to use a lookup chop now to pull values from any point in this uh, essentially table of values that we've created in our pattern chop um, based on the channel, the Z channel of the left hand. So that's how that works. We're just pulling a value from those channels and then applying that to our drawing uh, rectangle. So this I'm going to attach a null to because this is actually going to be um, some of the chop channels, these chop channels rather, are going to be some that are connected to our user interface. And so we want a null here just so we can select them later on. This is going to be called color space select. And now uh, 
Remember that in the original, we didn't just have a constantly changing color value. We were actually able to set our color value based on um, raising our left index finger. And so we will grab another select chop and pull in the lasso channel from our left hand. So there's our new select chop. And again, we just will grab the hand L lasso channel. And that means when I raise my left index finger, we will get a value of one. I'm gonna attach a null to the end of that. And then we will use a hold chop in order to um, hold the current color value whenever uh, we receive some information from this lasso channel. So that means, again, whenever I flick my left index finger up, it'll just grab the current color and hold it until I flick my finger up again. Um, we'll attach a null to that and call it color space draw. And we can actually attach that to our draw rectangle right away. So let's just take those RGB channels and make a chop reference to our um, color fill color value. And actually, while we're on the subject of making chop references, we haven't done anything with our erase rectangle or our user interface yet. And before we get too much further, we might as well do that so that for every future thing that we make, we can just apply it to all places at once. So um, since we forgot to do this last time, let's grab our cursor position and make a chop reference to both the erase rectangle, which as I mentioned before, needs to have the same position as the draw rectangle so that our you know cursor that we're setting up is uh, uniform between those two things. So let's um, make that chop reference, click on the er erase rectangle, grab the cursor X and Y chop channels, and make a chop reference to the center parameter of that. And then we also need to do the exact same thing to the cursor rectangle uh, that we set up previously for the user interface. So I'm going to um, make chop references to the center position of that cursor rectangle as well. And we can actually do the same thing with the color uh, draw chop. We're going to apply this to the draw color text um, so that our stored, quote unquote, stored color will show up within um, the color of that text. So let's, again, click on the draw color text and then come to the font color page and make ourselves a quick chop reference to those RGB channels. And then um, since we, again, just mentioned we set up this color select null for the user interface, let's also do the um, color bar. So the current color bar is where we apply that um, color select chop. Oops, and let me turn on that viewer active and then come back to my color bar since I accidentally deselected it. And then we'll make a chop reference to the fill color of that at the same time. And then we will do a quick review of what has just occurred. Um, okay, so what has happened? Well, um, we won't really be able to see a whole lot because our eraser functionality doesn't work yet. Um, but let me just turn off the parameter window. Um, you can see now that in the draw color section of the screen, I'm moving my left hand forward and backward in space and we're getting a real time output of what color that is effectively selecting for us or um, what the current color output would be. And then I'm going to flick my index finger up and now that color has been set into this draw color text. And that means um, if we were drawing, our erase functionality is, is overtaking our drawing right now and causing us to not be able to draw anything. But you can see there's that little orange square appearing behind the cursor, which is um, showing us that we would be drawing an orange if things were set up correctly. One thing I wanna make sure that we do before we continue on here is uh, make sure that our feedback loop is actually started functioning because we actually did not hook this up or uh, make a target top reference rather in our feedback top in the beginning when we built this network. So just go ahead and grab that comp2 operator and drag it over the feedback top and uh, that will make that reference in our feedback will now function. 
uh, that'll be important as we continue to test this to have that set up correctly. So now that we have finished the color, we can continue on with the eraser functionality. Um, and that will be followed by the move cursor functionality. Um, and the eraser functionality will start off with a uh, select chop, some middle mouse click on that null, and let's get ourselves a select chop. We're just going to be, for the eraser functionality, we're gonna grab the closed, hand L closed and hand R closed channels. I chose to use both of these channels together because it's harder to accidentally trigger um, the turning on of this mode. And that is what we're going to use here. Uh, follow that up with a logic chop. We're gonna combine both of these channels together using the combined channels and setting. After the logic chop, we're actually gonna grab ourselves a uh, pre-made network that comes from the expression chops operator snippet. So grab the expression chop and right click on it, open up the operator snippets for that. And you'll see there's this great little network in here that lets you get essentially a time delay um, output based on an input signal. So we will we'll press and hold this button and it takes one second of holding this button to get an output of one. And that basically we're gonna use to filter uh, out any accidental triggering of our erase mode. So select everything in this network except for that button, copy it and paste it back into our original network and then delete that original expression chop and move that over a little bit in space and then connect that logic chop to the null. And that looks great. I ended up adding a math chop right here between the null and the first input of that speed chop so that I could change the amount of time that it takes for this speed chop to go from zero to 0 0.5. So I wanted it to go even slower so that um, there was a little bit more of a time delay between us uh, closing our hands and getting an output of one. So what I did with this math chop was just change the output range uh, to 0 0.5 and that basically made it take twice as long for this speed chop to get from zero to 0 0.5. Let's go ahead and delete this on uh, null and we will add a logic chop right here because we want the eraser functionality to be switchable. So we don't wanna have to hold our hands up in that gesture to continue erasing. We want to be able to switch it on and off. So within the logic chop, just change the channel pre-operator to toggle. And then we are actually going to split this branch into two branches now. We're gonna have a branch for drawing and one for erasing. So I'm gonna right click on that output the first time and um, grab myself a rename chop. This is going to be the draw channel up here. So we will place that down and then we'll attach a math, oops, not a merge, but a math chop to our rename and we want this output to be basically the opposite of whatever um, we get out of this logic chop. So whenever it's in erase mode, which means the logic chop will give us a value of one, we want this to be zero. And whenever this is zero, meaning erase mode is off, we want draw to be one. So just come to the math page and we'll flip the output range to go from one to zero. And then we're gonna have to set up a uh, network that we're not going to quite finish yet here. We're going to add uh, a couple of different logic chops because we want to have that ability to move our cursor and we have to set up another branch of the network for that. So these are not really gonna do anything at the moment, but we will uh, work with them in a bit. So I guess we'll add a null first actually kind of move that over here and then uh, right click on that output, grab another logic chop and then move that over to the right a little bit. We'll attach a final null and we'll call this null draw. And finally, we will attach a second logic chop in between this null and this logic chop here. So. Again, this is going to 
be um, dealt with in just a moment, but this is how we're going to have the ability to turn on uh, or move our cursor without drawing, we're gonna use this functionality here. So don't worry about modifying these logic chops yet. We've done everything we need to do, but we still have to have a second channel coming into this logic chop to um, get the functionality that we want. So um, go ahead and copy that branch and paste it below and we will change within this rename operator uh, the name to erase. So this will be our erase channel here. And then we want to actually delete this math chop. And then we're just going to leave all of this stuff the same, except we will rename this final uh, null to erase so that we know that that is where that functionality comes from. And then, as I mentioned, we do need that move uh, channel functionality in order to make this um, these outputs function. So we're, we'll build that first and then we'll attach everything and make all our chop references and and then be done with that complex part of the network. Um, so for this one, uh, the move cursor functionality in the original was set up to um, be triggered by your right hand being closed and so we will again grab ourselves a select chop and middle mouse clicking on that null, grabbing a select chop, bringing that down, and then we only want the hand R closed channel in this case. And then we need to actually do a little bit of um, logic here because we don't want what's gonna happen and I know this because I've experimented with this, but you'll just kind of have to trust me. Um, because this erase functionality also uses the hand R closed channel, uh, basically, if I hold my hands up and close them both at the same time, you'll see we get an output of one in both of these branches of the network at the same time. And we don't want to switch between the erase and the draw setting and the move setting at the same time. We only want to go between either erase and draw or erase and move or draw and move. So we need a way to counteract that and that's what this logic is going to do for us. So let's go ahead and connect our logic chop up here from the uh, erase branch to this new logic chop. We'll flip the um, input order. I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, and then we will uh, choose the setting in here uh, combine chops exclusive or, and that will give us the functionality that we're looking for. Um, after that, we are actually going to copy and paste everything that we see from this null all the way to the logic and actually even uh, one of these renames because we're going to rename this chop channel. So go ahead and copy and paste that. We're gonna reuse all of this functionality for the move cursor channel as well. And then we'll connect that logic to this new null that we've created. And within this final uh, rename, well, actually, okay, I see one problem. Let's go within this expression, first of all, and make sure that under this expression, we change this speed one operator reference to speed two, because we now are in you know a different branch of the network. And there we go, we're now referencing the right one. Uh, within this rename, let's change our channel name to move for move cursor. And then I think what we'll do is um, maybe even shift all of this down just slightly in space because it's getting a little bit claustrophobic over there. Um, after that, we can attach a null and we'll call this null move. And now we can deal with all of this stuff here. Um, so we're going to connect this move null to this logic chop, uh, which again is the one connected to the eraser or the erase channel. And we'll connect it to the one connected to the draw channel as well. And then we'll come within both of these lower logic chops here. And we'll select them both at the same time because we want to apply the same settings to both. We'll do combine chops and that'll combine those two channels together. 
And then um, in the final logic chops in both of those networks, we'll come to the um, combined chops parameter here, make sure they're both selected, and again, use that exclusive or mode. And that will allow us to get the functionality that we want. So now that we've got these set up, you're probably wondering, okay, great, what do we do with these now? Um, so what these channels essentially are giving us is an alpha value for our draw rectangle and our erase rectangle. So we can actually, um, well, let's turn the viewer active for both of those chops, and then I'll click on the draw rectangle, make a chop reference to the fill alpha parameter of that one, and then within the erase rectangle, we will do the exact same thing. And that means that basically our um, drawing, erasing, and move cursor functionality should be ready to go. So let me just turn off, you know what, we might as well composite in a, uh, a background while we're at it so we don't have to look at that alpha um, checkerboard background. So I'm just going to use the shortcut of the RGB key after the composite, which will place a black background behind everything. Uh, so let's take a look. So unfortunately, we haven't uh, made our UI all that active yet, except for this draw color section. So we can't really see what's going on. But right now, because we are neither in draw or erase mode, that means we are um, in the move mode, which we can actually see down here is on. So I will now turn it, the move mode off. And that means we should be in erase mode. And lo and behold, we are. And then let me try to switch to the draw mode. And now we should be drawing. Let me see if we can set a different color here. There we go. Let's see if the purple will draw. Perfect. And then um, we should be able to turn the move mode back on and not draw anything anymore. And there we go. That is functioning perfectly. So now um, all that's left to do is setting up a uh, actually pretty simple chop branch to control the um, ability to clear our drawing from the screen. And then we need to um, make these other parts of the user interface active so that uh, you know they show us the information that they're supposed to. So OK, let's move this out of the way. Um, we're going to create this clear function by grabbing yet another select chop, so middle mouse click on that null, grab a select, and then we'll come down here. And in this case, we are going to use both of the lasso channels, which again is your index finger being raised. So I'm just going to grab those two. And we're using both just for the same reason as above that it's harder to um, accidentally trigger. So we're going to use a logic chop again to combine those two channels together. Uh, use the combine channels setting and, and we should be good to go there. And that is actually all that we really need to do with that one. So we'll attach a null and we might as well drag it all the way over here to be in line with the other ones. Um, and we'll call this one clear. Oh, uh, you know what? And I do actually want to rename the chop channel to clear as well. So let's add a rename before that null. There we go, and we'll call rename the channel to clear. And we can now hook that up to two separate places. Actually, we will hook it up to our feedback top up here to the reset switch. And let's just do that. There we go. And then we also need to do the same thing to the clear text up here, um, but not to a reset parameter, but actually to the alpha. So let's come back down here, grab that clear chop channel and apply that to our font alpha parameter. And now that should, if we flip our display back on and get rid of the parameter window again, um, if we hold up our index fingers, which you can't see, but I'm doing, we are clearing the screen and the clear text is coming up to confirm that that's what we're doing. So there we go. We are really close now. We just need to uh, deal with this mode uh, portion of the screen, our user interface rather, and then we are good to, uh, you know, you can start experimenting with this and doing your own drawing and, and whatnot. Um, let's just turn off that display again. 
So for the mode, we are going to um, do, we have to do two things. So we need to, first of all, point our text top to the right cell within that table. And then we also need to modify or animate the size of that bar that appears below it. And we need to apply a color value to that bar. Uh, so we'll start with the um, pointing of that text top to the right tables or the right cells within that table. I'm going to use a select chop. Uh, but instead of connecting it to anything, I'm going to grab the channel or the chops, uh, the erase chop. Or actually, let's see what the order is here within our table. I think it was draw, move, and erase. Um, so we'll grab draw space move space erase within this chop parameter and we should get all of those channels right here which is perfect uh let's use a logic chop and we will um combine or actually we want to use the radio button setting here channel pre-operator and then we want to combine the channels via we can use the um, highest index on parameter so what that means is if we flip back to the draw mode, we'll get a uh, value in our channel of zero. And if we go back to the move mode, we'll get a value of one. And then if we go to the erase mode, we should get a value of two. And so that uh, chop channel value will give us basically the uh, cell, the row number that we are looking for in that table. So I'm gonna um, attach a rename just like I've done for everything else to specify what this channel is doing. And I'll put it in line with everything else. We're gonna call this chop channel mode. And then we'll attach a null right here, which we will also call mode. And then we can actually bring that in. Uh, actually, let's turn the viewer active on so that we can um, make that chop reference click on that mode text top from long ago, and we can make ourselves a chop reference from here to the dat row parameter. And what that means is if we're in mode two, we should be in the eraser mode. And let's take a look and see if that's displaying. So that is indeed what is showing up. So if I switch to the move mode, there we go. We're seeing that display. And then if I change to the draw mode, that also displays and then I can flip back to the move mode and perfect. We are seeing visual feedback about what is happening. Um, so now what we need to do is uh, add ourselves a little bit of a visual cue to see when we are transitioning between the uh, different modes. Again, remember that all of those are based on that um, speed chop section of the network, which takes us uh, two seconds of holding in any of those positions in order to switch between modes. And so we're just gonna make ourselves a little visual indicator to show how much longer we have to hold that. Uh, so the way that I achieved this was by attaching a, um, a math chop to both of the speed chops here. Uh, so we'll grab that math chop right now and bring up the parameter window again. So again, connect it to the speed one chop and the speed two chop right here. And then uh, we are going to combine those chops via the um, maximum setting. So within this math chop, we're also gonna make some modifications to the range of the output because this is going to set the width of that uh, small line underneath the mode setting. So this input or the from range rather section, um, both of these speed chops go by default, or at least in the way this network is set up from zero to 0 0.5. So we'll set our from range to zero to 0 0.5 and then our output range zero, obviously, because we want the bar to disappear when uh, neither of our hands are held up and we're not trying to change modes, but we need to set the maximum here to whatever width makes sense for that particular bar. So if I look back at the screen, um, it looks like we may need to adjust the width of this thing a little bit. And I think I'll just try 
increasing this somewhat so that it's close to the length of this. Um, let me just flip back to draw mode. Yeah, that looks okay. Um, let's see what we ended up with here. So we could even do just one. 0 0.155 is what we'll use for that value so that it is close to the length of that operator um, or that text there. So in the two range within this math way back over here in the network, 0 0.155. Um, then we will attach a rename and we will call this um, mode bar or maybe bar size or something, maybe bar size makes more sense. Uh, bar underscore size in that rename and then we will attach a null and call that bar size as well. And we'll just have to know that that means we are attaching it to the mode bar, which is the only bar that changes size in our network. So let's go ahead and make a chop reference from here to the size X parameter of that operator. And now what that means is when I, let me turn on my connect viewer here just so you can see what's going on. Um, it's a bit small. There we go. Okay, so when I hold up, let's say I wanna to switch to the move mode. Now you can see we get that animation that shows up when I hold my hand up in that gesture and it kind of gives me a visual cue of how much longer I have to hold my hand until we switch between those modes. And the same thing will happen when we're switching between either erase and draw or erase and move or uh, draw and move. So I think that's a pretty handy little uh, indicator to show us exactly how much time we have left to hold those positions. The um, the final thing that I want to do here is uh, give ourselves a little bit of a color cue for uh, how many hands we have held up or how many it's at least sensing at the current moment because often it'll kind of miss sense uh, or you know miss sense whether or not your hand is closed. So it's nice to be, just have a visual confirmation of what's going on behind the scenes. So basically we're gonna change the color of that bar when you have just your right hand closed. We're gonna change that color or that bar to gray and when both hands are closed, we'll change them, change it to white. Um, so what we're going to do for this is uh, we're going to use this, I guess we can either we can just make another select chop so that we don't have a huge jumble of wires or cables here, but uh, let me just move everything down a little bit. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to go in between these things. You could just go at the bottom, but this is where it landed in my original version of the network. You flip the parameter window back on. So grab yourself another select chop. And then within that one, we are going to grab the closed channels again. And then this time we are going to um, use a select chop, make two branches basically from this. And we'll attach a second select chop here to grab just the right hand uh, channel, right hand closed channel. And then on a separate branch, from this initial select chop. We'll hook up a logic chop and we'll combine those channels via the AND setting. We'll then attach both of those to a uh, math chop. Accidentally grab the merge chop, okay. Math chop, we'll connect both of those to it and then we will uh, combine these chops via the AD setting. And then we actually wanna change our output range here from, uh, from zero to one in the from range to from zero to two, because when these two channels are both on at the same time and added together, they will um, have a value of two and we want them to be between uh, zero and one because they're gonna be attached to RGB channels. Then we will use a rename chop to just uh, clarify what this channel is doing and so We'll call this uh, mode underscore fill. And that's just telling us that that's exactly what that is doing. And then we can attach a null and bring it in line with everything else way over here. And we'll call this uh, 
We'll also call this mode space fill. We can then take that chop channel and come way back up to our mode bar and then apply that chop reference to our fill color and make sure you do that over the title so that it gets all of the RGB values, uh, all three channels rather at the same time. One final thing that we're going to do is add some stuff to our network to correct for an issue that you'll probably no doubt have uh, experienced already. The left hand uh, lasso, which again is the raising of the index finger interaction, triggers the color change and the clearing of the screen is triggered by both the left and the right index finger being raised at the same time. So what will happen is since those use the same channels um, for the functionality to be triggered, when you clear your screen, you'll also inevitably change the color that you have currently set. And so we're going to set up a small logic based network to uh, basically correct for that issue. So come back to the color setting section of the network and we're actually going to first insert a logic chop after that select chop. And within this one, we're going to change the uh, combined chops setting here to exclusive or then we're going to need to connect a second logic chop to that select and we'll place that down and connect it to our first one here. Within this one, we're going to use combined chops and and then we're actually going to have to attach even more to this as well. Uh, so go ahead and copy this select, paste that down, and then we're going to add to that select the right hand lasso channel as well. Then we're going to attach a third logic chop here. And in this one, set combined channels to and. And then we can connect that one to the uh, second one that we dropped down previously. And then what we can do to make that uh, color selection even less likely to accidentally trigger because you'll still run into situations where, for example, if your left finger was raised first, even just slightly, you can see how it triggers it just briefly there for a second when I raise my left hand a little bit more quickly than my right. Uh, we can add that same time delay functionality that we found from the uh, expression chop to that part of the network. So go ahead and we'll just copy and paste that. Um, grab from the null to the expression. We'll bring it up here and paste and uh, we'll shift everything over just slightly. And then we'll connect that logic chop to the null and the expression to the final null here. And then um, I think two seconds is a little bit too long to hold your hand or your index finger up to uh, set the color. So within this math chop, let's just change the two range from uh, 0 0.5 to 2. And that means that now it'll take us half a second of delay time to set our color. And that should uh, basically counteract any of that uh, potential misfiring that will inevitably occur. Let's also make sure that within this expression chop that we've added to our network that we do the same thing that we've done with the previous ones where we uh, change the speed chop that it is pointing to within the expression parameter. In this case, we just want to point it to the speed three chop instead of the speed one chop. And we are all set. Okay, so one final, final thing that we are going to add to this network before we close out here is the ability to uh, visualize how long this um, color set time delay takes just like for the uh, mode switching so that there's a visual indicator showing you how long you need to hold up your index finger. Um, I just think that's good practice as a user interface element because otherwise, you know, you can kind of be clueless as to whether or not it's responding or uh, correctly picking up your index finger being lifted, which occasionally will happen. So I think that, you know, even though I know you're probably like, oh my gosh, this video just keeps going on and on and on. Well, this is the, the final thing that we are going to add to this network, and I think it'll be a worthwhile addition. So uh, we've got that, that new uh, logic portion added, the little thing from the expression chop that we saw elsewhere. Let's add ourselves a, uh, a second bar on the left side of the screen, which we can actually do, I guess we'll do underneath that one that shows you the current um, 
like color position of your hand. Uh, so let's take the draw color text in the current color bar tops and shift those up and then we'll copy and paste the current color bar and we will call this one um, color space set space bar because this is what's going to show us you know how long it's going to take us holding our hand in that position to set the color. Grab that and connect it to the composite and then we'll flip up that color set bar in the input order until it is underneath the current color bar. It doesn't really matter as long as it's above the uh, cursor rectangle in the render, but um, just for clarity, I'm gonna do it that way. And then let's flip our display back on and we'll just modify this uh, position of this slightly. So I'm just going to shift it down a little bit in space until I find something that looks reasonable. I guess, I don't know, it doesn't have to be perfectly aligned, but that that's probably good. So I did uh, 0.336 in the Y center position. I am gonna right click and hit reset parameter on the fill color so that it's just a white bar. And that'll kind of mirror the uh, bar for the move or the mode switching that's on the other side of the screen. Uh, now we're just gonna have to add a similar small network uh, like we did here with a math and a rename and a null, which is attached to the speed chop. So you can go ahead and middle mouse click on the output of the speed chop. And we'll, um, I guess we'll start with the math like we did before. And then we'll attach, you know, our rename and our null after that. But within the math, all we have to do this time is change our from range from zero to 0 0.5 and then our to range uh, I've already kind of prepared this, but 0 0.145 is the width that we set for the length of these, uh, or the width of these bars, rather. So that's what we're going to use for the uh, two range upper limit. And now we can hook up the rename. And we'll call this uh, color underscore set underscore size. It's a little bit long, but that's okay. And then um, after that, we'll attach our null and we can place that over here in line with the other ones. And we'll call that the same thing, color space uh, set space size. Let's grab that, click on that color set bar operator, and then we'll make a chop reference from this color set size parameter and apply it to the size X parameter. So now that we have added a second progress bar for the color setting, I think it makes sense to rename the final null and the chop channel for the mode bar size. Um, this was incorporated into the network before I decided that I was gonna have a, uh, another bar for the color setting. And so I didn't really think about using a, uh, a kind of specified name for it and left it as something more generic. So it's a small change, but I'm gonna call this one now uh, mode bar size instead of just bar size. So I'm gonna come first within the rename chop, type in mode underscore uh, before that bar size parameter. And then I'll do the same thing for the uh, final null here, add mode space uh, before that bar size title and that it will break the chop reference but all I have to do is just come back to my mode bar top here and then um, make myself another chop reference from that operator and that finally completes the network let's come back over to the connect for a moment here okay so we are in the move mode and now we're in the draw mode perfect okay so I'm gonna find a different color like red, and you'll see that bar fills up to show me, you know, hold for a little bit longer until the color is set. And you'll see sometimes it does miss trigger and that's why it's kind of important to have that on-screen confirmation that, um, you know, it actually is picking up your index finger being raised on your left hand and that it's, you know, working to set the color. And then if I raise both of my, um, index fingers, you'll see that it clears without, um, oh, well, I'm raising my left one now, it will clear without setting the color like we wanted to. So that finally 
is it for this tutorial. We've, uh, you know, even gone beyond the original scope of what the tutorial was supposed to cover here and kind of made some uh, real-time adjustments and modifications to the network as, you know, we often will do with any sort of touch designer project. And I think that all of the improvements that have been made have been really uh, for a good reason because they've helped to make this uh, program more useful and more usable for us. Uh, so I hope that you have enjoyed this tutorial and learned something from it. I think if nothing else, uh, you can see how the Kinect can be a super powerful tool uh, when you're working within Touch Designer to make all kinds of different interactive projects. Normally we would have a section here where we're going to look at how you can take this network and push it further, but because this video no doubt has turned into a kind of sprawling tutorial and probably one of the longer ones on my channel. I'm going to split that out into a separate video, which I will post in the next couple of days. Uh, so be on the lookout for that on my channel here. And um, we'll cover, you should be seeing on screen now, some uh, footage of what that will entail. But we're going to look at the fact that we are actually using instances to uh, draw on screen right now. And so we're dealing with 3D geometry and there are a whole bunch of things that we can mess with uh, with 3D geometry and instances that we haven't even looked at yet. So uh, we will experiment with that a little bit in that follow up video. So with that, this has been another touch designer tutorial. Make sure that you like and subscribe to keep up with the many touch designer tutorial videos that I'll be posting here over the summer. If you'd like to keep up with my daily experiments and content that I am working on for future videos, you can follow me on Instagram at Jack Delora. Should be appearing on screen now. It's the same name as the current YouTube channel that you are watching this on. If you have any questions or suggestions for future tutorials, feel free to leave a comment below. As with my uh, several recent tutorials, use the hashtag AnotherTDTutorial if you try this technique for yourself and end up posting it to social media. I'm just curious to see how people are taking these techniques and um, modifying them and making their own versions of what is covered in the video. And I think it'd be great for anybody else who tries them as well to get some inspiration and see how other people are, you know, taking those methods and doing interesting things with them. So with that, we will close out this video. I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching.